All right, welcome back guys. This is uh, unit one of AP Calc, part one of limits. All right, so we're gonna be, as you might imagine, covering uh, the pretty basic introduction to what a limit is. Let's get into limits. So what is a limit, okay? Let's say we've got a function f of x equals x minus one. So we see our function, we see our graph, it makes sense so far. Now let's introduce this new word, the limit, okay? Now the notation for a limit is the limit as x approaches some number of f of x equals some y value. So just by looking at this graph, we can say that the graph approaches negative one as x approaches zero, okay? A limit is defined as what y value does my function approach as my x value gets closer and closer to a certain value, okay? So let's take x equals zero, for example. What y value does f of x get closer and closer to as x gets closer and closer to zero? So that would be written as the limit as x approaches zero of f of x, okay? We're looking at what y value does f of x go to when x gets closer and closer to zero. And if we look at our graph, we can look from the right, x, or excuse me, y, gets closer and closer to negative one as x approaches zero. And if we approach from the right, we can say that as x gets closer and closer to zero from the right, y gets closer and closer to negative one, okay? And we can prove that by just going into f of x and finding f of zero equals negative one, all right? So we can now evaluate this limit to e equal negative one. Now, this method I just showed you only works if the function is continuous. You guys covered continuity in pre-calc. I hope you know what cont continuous means. It means that the function has no discontinuities of any kind. Okay, so let me give you a different example. Let's draw the graph, the example I used last time. X x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Let's draw that graph. Looks a little something like this with a discontinuity at x equals negative 1. Okay? So, we should be able to evaluate the similar limit again. Okay, we've let's try and find the limit as x goes to zero of f of x when f of x equals this function. Now the way we would do that is we would look at when x is going to zero, zero, the point right here, as we approach zero from the left, which means from the negative side, from the left side of the graph, we are approaching negative one. As we approach from the right side of the graph, as we approach from the positive side, we're approaching negative one. And we know that f of x is continuous at x equals negative one, because we can see it on the graph. Now, we're going to get into that topic a little later where if we don't have the graph, how can we prove it's continuous? But that's a topic for another time.
So we can see by the graph that it's continuous at x equals negative 1. Therefore, we can find the limit simply by plugging into the function. f of 0 equals... Oh, sorry, this is continuous at x equals 0. My, my mistake. f of 0 equals negative 1. And because f of x is continuous at x equals 0, we know that f of 0 equals the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x equals negative 1. Now, um, again, I would highly recommend you going to Khan Academy. They have a fantastic uh, set of practice problems, fantastic set of videos on limits. I'd highly recommend you go check those out. None of this is sponsored, by the way. This is just me and my journey as I self-studied this entire course. I know exactly the questions you guys might have. I know exactly what problems you might run into. Khan Academy is great if you need something extra outside of this. Absolutely fantastic. Could not recommend it enough. Okay. And also, if you've got questions, if you've got concerns that I haven't covered in the video, if you haven't seen covered on Khan Academy, I have a Discord server. It's linked. Send me a message. DM me. Whatever. I'm always available for you guys. Now back to limits, okay? So, now we incur a little bit of a hiccup when we change this limit a bit. What is the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x? And you'll see here that f of negative 1 is undefined, okay? We've got a discontinuity there. Well, let me tell you a little characteristic about limits. Limits don't care if the function is defined, okay? It could be defined, it could be undefined, they don't care if it's defined, because we're not looking at what f of negative 1 equals, we're looking at what f of x approaches, okay? And approaching something allows it to converge to a distinct value even if that value is not defined on the graph okay that's what i that's why i was pushing this idea on you guys of what value does it approach from the left what value does it approach from the right what value does the function approach never once did we use the definition of the function to help us determine what it approached, okay? We're only allowed to use that if it's continuous at the value we're evaluating, okay? Now, let me try and give this a more numerical value to try and uh, get you guys on board with me here, okay? So let's, let's do a table of values, okay? Let's say the top's going to be x, the bottom's going to be f of x, all right? We're trying to find x equals negative 1. So let's put that in the center. So we have x equals negative 0 0.999. Oh, no, it would be 999 would be on the other side because this is negative. So let's try 0 0.99. It's negative 0 0.9. And we've got negative 1.01, negative 1.1. So if you'll notice here, these are these x uh, x values are consistently getting closer and closer to negative one from both sides. That's an important uh, characteristic I want you to take away from this. A limit has to approach a certain value from both sides. It's not enough for it to approach negative 1 simply from the left or simply from the right. It needs to approach a negative 1 from both sides. So we can sort of contain this value in between two, two bounds, okay? Uh, think of it like uh, a tube of toothpaste, all right? Think of this like a tube of toothpaste. If you're pushing on it from one end, all the toothpaste is going to squirt out the other. We need to push on it from both ends to make sure it converges to a single point, a single value. Okay, so 
what was our function here? x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. If we plug in negative 1.1, we're going to get negative 2.1. We're going to get here negative 2.01. We don't know what this is because it's undefined. If we plug in negative 0.009, we're going to get negative 1.99. We're going to get negative 1.9. But, if you look at this table of values, you start to see a pattern. Even though f of negative 1, technically speaking, is undefined, the limit exists. And we know it exists because from the left and from the right, the numerical value seems to converge to a single digit. And if you look closely at how these two numbers behave, we're getting closer and closer to the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x equals negative 2. Okay, because our numbers are converging to negative 2 at x equals negative 1. I can't stress this enough. f of negative 1 is still undefined. Okay? The definition, or where the function is defined, is still non-existent. However, the limit does indeed exist. We don't care about the value of the function at this point. We only care about what it's approaching. What it's approaching. In calculus, uh, we've got three different methods for finding limits. We can find them graphically by looking at the graph. And in the graph, we would be given a coordinate plane with points on it, etc., etc. And we'd be able to find exactly where this discontinuity would lie just with our bare eyes. Okay? That's one form. And the second form is with this table of values I just demonstrated to you. By seeing what these values approach from each end and determining what value should go in this question mark area. Or we can solve them algebraically, which you've seen played out here where we plug the number into the function and see what the y value is defined as. Again, that's only possible if, if the function is continuous, okay? The graphical method and the table of values method are purely introductory methods. You're never going to see them on the AP exam. They're purely methods we use to introduce limits and to teach you how limits work and how limits behave. Algebraically is what we're going to use going forward because it's far and beyond the most powerful way to evaluate limits and it's where uh, questions will be based around on the AP exam. Okay, so don't forget these in case you need a refresher on how limits work, but we're going to be going forward with algebraic limits uh, moving forward and we're going to start off how we can identify if a function is continuous without ever looking at the graph. Because remember, we need to ensure it is continuous before we evaluate what the function is, what the function is defined as at the point. I understand that uh, a lot of you guys need a good amount of practice with limits because, uh, you know, the first unit of every AP course with all the introductory material is always the hardest to wrap your head around. Uh, so I can always recommend you guys to Khan Academy. One thing that I used was uh, Princeton Review Books. Uh, you, you see a, a, quite an entertaining picture of me uh, last year when, with all my uh, review books with my APs. But those books are absolutely amazing. If you plan on needing yourself some extra review, some extra study material, some extra questions, they pretty much go through the entire course for you. They're fantastic. They're, I'm positive all of them are less than 20 bucks each. They're an amazing investment, okay? If you ever need any more practice or review, you buy that. Anyway, on to um, part two of limits. Uh, algebraic way of determining limits, which is effectively determining continuity and then plugging into the function. Okay, so let's, let's bring this guy over here. I really like this guy. So let's define f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Okay? And the graph for that would look like this, with a whole removable discontinuity right at 
x equals negative 1. Write that. Okay. Now, we talked about the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x is not undefined. Okay? It does exist because the graph approaches some value here, even though f of negative 1 is indeed undefined. Where the function is defined and where the limit are two different things, okay? Because remember, limits do not care about the definition of the function. Okay? So, in our unit zero video, we discussed how removable discontinuities can indeed be removed. So if we were to remove this discontinuity from the graph, we'd be able to say f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And then after we factor that, we'd be able to say x minus 1 over x plus 1 over x plus 1. And then we'd be able to say equals x minus 1 except at x equals negative 1, right? Because these two graphs are the same graph, except this guy has discontinuity. Discontinuity at x equals negative 1, and this guy doesn't. So the same, they're the same graph, except that x equals negative 1. But, but, this is a very useful manipulation for limits, because, since they are the same graph everywhere except x equals negative 1, that means both functions approach, approach the same value at x equals negative 1, okay? Because we determined in the last video that this limit the limit as x goes to negative 1 of f of x equals negative 2 from our table of values right here. And we're able to see here, if we plug in negative 1 to this function, x minus 1, negative 1 minus 1 equals negative 2. Okay? They both approach the same value at x equals negative 1. And since there's no discontinuities anywhere else, they also approach the same value, same value everywhere else. Everywhere. Okay? Because aside from that one single point, they're the same graph. Therefore, if we're faced with the limit as x approaches negative 1 from of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1, if we're faced with this limit, obviously our first instinct with limits is let's try plugging in the negative 1. Let's see if we can get something uh, legible from that, okay? And if you plug in negative 1, you see it becomes negative 1 squared minus 1 over negative 1 plus 1, which becomes 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form. Okay? Now what that means is if we get a 0 over 0 or any of the other indeterminate forms, such as infinity over infinity, infinity over 0, um, we are unable to determine what our limit is. We are unable to know whether the limit exists. We are unable to know whether the limit does not exist. Okay? Uh, a case where the limit does not exist is if we have vertical asymptote. Okay? And if we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, one side of the graph, you know, from the left, it approaches positive infinity and the other side of the graph from the right approaches negative infinity, 
So the limit doesn't exist because the limit from the left and the limit from the right approach two different values, and therefore they're not constricting down to a single value, okay? We need them to constrict and converge down to a single value in order for the limit to exist. So in this case, we would say the limit does not exist. We abbreviate that as D and E. But back to this guy. When we have an indeterminate form, you know, we're not done. We need to find a way to solve the limit. So how do we do that? Let's try and get rid of the removable discontinuity. We can say that the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1 equals the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x minus 1 because these two graphs have the same exact limits because they both approach the same value, okay? That is called the replacement theorem. The replacement theorem states that any two functions, if they differ by a finite number of removable discontinuities, have the same limits everywhere. Let me say that again for you guys. The replacement theorem states that two functions who have a who are the same function, the same graph, but differ by a finite number of removable discontinuities. One, one removable discontinuity is a finite number, but you could have six removable discontinuities on this graph, and you would still be able to use the replacement theorem to replace this with that. Because if the two functions differ by only a finite number of removable discontinuities, their limits are the same everywhere. Meaning, this limit equals this limit by the replacement theorem. You need to write that, okay? Um, I don't believe limits are an FRQ on the AP exam, but if they are an FRQ, you would need to write this little blurb on the FRQ, comma, by the replacement theorem. If your teacher gives you tests and they have you uh, do an FRQ with limits, you need to write by the replacement theorem to get full credit. Okay, so now we can take this limit and we can evaluate it just fine with direct substitution. Direct substitution means you just plug in. So if we plug in negative one for x, we can see here, it's as simple as that, equals negative 2. And that's our limit. That's the algebraic way for solving limits. All right. Now, limits are also useful for defining continuity. Okay. So the way we define continuity at a point is we have three... Um, what was the what's the right word? Three characteristics that need to be met in order for the function to be continuous at a point. Okay, let's take this graph right here, uh, x minus one. Let's look at that for example. The first characteristic that must be met is uh, f of x has to exist. Okay, it means the function has to be defined at the point you're trying to determine. Okay? Continuity can exist at a point. Okay, let's say x equals 0, if we're trying to define a point. Let's say, is it continuous at x equals 0? You can tell by the graph that it's continuous at x equals 0, but we're trying to determine it more empirically. f of x has to exist. f of x exists. 2. The limit as x approaches 0 of f of x has to exist. Now, the way we prove that is the function approaches a number from the left, approaches a number from the left, 
the function approaches a number from the right, it approaches a number from the right, and they approach the same number. So we have a notation for that, okay? We can say the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, that little negative sign uh, indicates from the left, of f of x, and we have the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, the little positive sign indicates from the right, of f of x. Okay? What we're going to need to show for x equals negative 1 right here is we're going to need to show that the limit as x approaches 0 from the left equals negative, uh, negative 1 equals negative 1, which also equals the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, okay? If the limit from the left equals the limit from the right, this stands for all cases, then the limit as x approaches 0 in general equals negative 1 and it exists, okay? If for any reason the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right, then the limit does not exist. Okay, that's how we determine if a limit exists. It's the be-all, end-all to determine whether a limit exists or not. Does the limit from the left equal the limit from the right? Does it approach the same number from the left that it approaches from the right? Okay, so that's how we prove that the limit as x goes to zero of f of x exists. Check mark. And the third characteristic that it must meet in order to be continuous is the limit as x approaches 0 or whatever point of f of x has to equal f of x, has to equal what the function is defined at that point. And we can see here that f of 0 does in fact equal negative 1 Limit as x equals 0 equals negative 1, which also equals f of 0. Check mark, check mark. f of x is continuous at x equals 0 because, and you have to write this because statement, and you would say all of these three things. f of x is defined at x equals 0. The limit as x goes to 0 of f of x exists because the limit as x goes to 0 from the left equals the limit as x goes to 0 from the right, and the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x equals f of x. You have to write all of that. It's a very long uh, process if you're given this question as an FRQ. If an FRQ asks you to determine the continuity of a function at a point, you have to write all of this. Work, showing your work and showing your reasoning, is a huge, huge topic in calculus A, B, and B, C. So I hope you guys are ready to commit to that early on. Okay, moving on. What else do we need to cover? The Intermediate Value Theorem. Okay. IBT, as it is abbreviated, states the following. If a function is continuous continuous on some closed interval on some closed interval closed interval just means hard brackets so hard brackets some closed interval from a to b then the function must achieve every y value between a and b. Now let me demonstrate that a bit for you, okay? Let's draw a graph here, okay? Some huge squiggly line, okay? And let's say this right here is a, this right here is b, all right? So on the interval a to b, is this interval right here. You can see just by looking at the graph that this is continuous everywhere. 
okay? There's no infinite discontinuities, there's no holes, there's no gaps, there's no jumps, there's no nothing. It's continuous from A to B, okay? What this means, function must achieve every y value between A and B, is let's say A is negative 5, A is at uh, y equals negative 5, and B is at y equals 10. This function must achieve negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, so on and so forth, 9, comma, 10. And all of the decimals and other whatnot in between all of those numbers. Because if a function is continuous, it has only one way to get from point A to point B, and that's to go through every number between them, okay? If a function was discontinuous, then if this point right here was A and this point right here was B, then we could just go, oh, hole in the graph, boom. You see, if it's discontinuous, it's got all of these y values that it never achieves. It never takes on that value. But since it's continuous, it has to go through sort of every path, every number that stands between A and B. Okay, common mistake is this is referring to y values. It must achieve every y value, vertical value between A and B. Okay? It's already given by basic logic that a function has to achieve every x value between A and B. We all know that. That doesn't need to be proven, that's common sense. Make sure you get some good practice here with the replacement theorem. Khan Academy's got some great videos on that. Uh, there are several types of methods to use the replacement theorem. Uh, first of all, you've got the factoring, which we just used in our example here. Uh, we have um, multiplying by the complex conjugate. Not the con just the conjugate, sorry. We have multiplying by the conjugate, which is a method you would use when you have uh, radicals present in your limit. Uh, Khan Academy's got some great practice problems on uh, multiplying by the conjugate. This was a topic you guys covered in pre-calc. You might need a bit of a refresher on that. Another very common uh, way of using the replacement theorem is through uh, trig uh, replacements, trig substitutions, okay? The trig replacements are often the hardest for kids because they require you to memorize a bunch of different trig identities. The, the most common one, you know, is cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, and that can manipulated, be manipulated to equal cosine squared equals one minus sine squared and so on and so forth. Uh, limits are always, you know, the most uh, most tedious part about calculus to learn. Don't worry, it gets a lot more fun from here on out. So let's um, let's start uh, to tackle some of these uh, trigonometry limits, okay? Because we're right now we're in purely algebraically solving limits with the replacement theorem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Remember, you need to write by the replacement theorem every time you replace a function, every time you replace a removable discontinuity. So let's get into this with uh, two limits that you're just going to need to memorize for the time being, okay? Now here we have the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x, okay? The limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x equals one, okay? Now, if you use direct substitution on that, you get a zero over zero in determinant form. And right now, we have no way of solving this algebraically. Right now, you're just going to need to memorize it. If you want to learn how to solve it algebraically, that's gonna be covered in some future units. If you wanna look ahead right now, uh, the topic is called L'Hopital's Rule. It might be very helpful for you to learn right now. However, it's a lot more complex it requires a lot more knowledge that we will cover later. It, you might not be ready for it right now, but if, you, uh, if you're someone like me, 
and just wants to know everything now, be my guest, try and teach it to yourself. But moving on, we've got a second limit that we want to pay attention to, and that's the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x over x. And that equals um, zero. All right. So these two, again, you're going to use uh, direct substitution. You're going to find zero over zero in determinant form. And you're going to have to use a future topic known as L'Hopital's rule in order to prove that this limit equals zero and this limit equals one. But for right now, you just need to memorize these because these are going to be component parts of other limits that we're going to try solving uh, right now. Okay? So, classic example of a trigonometry limit is a uh, limit as x goes to zero of sine squared over x squared, okay? Now, the funny thing about trig limits is that doing a trig substitution is not always going to get you somewhere, okay? So, right here, we could say that this equals the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 minus cosine squared x over x squared, and we just get another indeterminate form. That didn't help us at all. If I were to write by the replacement theorem, So now that we're dealing with more complex limits, we're going to have to dip into all of the new limit properties, okay? So let's look at those right now. If we have the limit as x goes to zero of f of x plus g of x, okay, let's say f of x is x and g of x is uh, x squared. Let's rewrite this as the limit as x goes to zero of x plus x squared. That can be broken up into the limit as x goes to zero of x plus the limit as x goes to zero of x squared. Okay? The same thing applies for the minus sign. If we do subtraction, the same principle also holds. All right? Same principle also holds for multiplication. It can be broken up and we can take the limit sign out of the uh, operation. If I give you limit, the limit as x goes to zero of x squared divided by x, that equals the limit as x goes to zero of x squared all over the limit as x goes to zero of x. So you can take the division bar out of the limit symbol and separate the two limits. You can break apart the limit sign pretty much any way that makes algebraic sense, okay? If I give you the limit as x goes to zero of 8x, that's the same as 8 times the limit as x goes to 0 of x. You can take the constant multiple out. Now if we break this down into its more, I'm going to call it, elementary steps, the limit as x goes to 0 equals the limit as x goes to 0 of 8 times the limit as x goes to 0 of x. And if we try and use direct substitution on this limit, we're going to find there's no way we can plug in our x, because there's no x. Therefore, the limit is just 8. It's just the constant. So this, therefore, becomes 8 times the limit as x goes to 0 of x. And that's how we got here. Okay. So always be aware of how you can manipulate your limits algebraically. That brings us back to here. 
this can be broken up through this multiplication rule into so the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x multiplied by the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. Sine x times sine x is sine squared. x times x is x squared. So we broke that up, and now we use the limit over here that we need to memorize. Remember, guys, you need to memorize this. And that can bring us down to 1 times 1 equals 1. Therefore, limit as x approaches 0 of sine squared x over x squared equals 1. And that's your final answer. All right. So there's a, another topic that we're going to have to sort of reason our way through it right now. And it's going to make a lot more sense later when we cover L'Hopital's rule. But for right now, you're going to need to be capable of evaluating these limits without L'Hopital's rule, which is why we're going to cover it right now. Again, guys, if you've got any questions, if you need any extra help, I have a Discord server. It's linked. It's, it's where you can DM me. It's where you can message me. It's where I can just hop on a VC call with you. I can set up my camera. I can do my whiteboard for you live. If you've got any extra questions, don't worry. Just join. Give me a call. Moving on. We have um, this thing called the hierarchy of speeds. Or at least I like to call it that. Okay? Now, what the hierarchy of speeds is, is pretty simple. Okay? If I've got a function like, let's say, x squared. Okay? If I try and graph x squared, looks a little something like that. If I try to graph e to the x looks a little something like that. If I try to graph y equals x, just a straight line, okay? What's meant by the hierarchy of speeds is how fast do each of these uh, functions grow? Obviously, x grows the slowest out of the three. x squared grows in the middle, and e to the x grows the fastest. So, when we're looking at limits at infinity, limits at infinity, we're looking at how functions behave as we grow closer and closer to positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay. So, if I gave you the limit as x approaches positive infinity, right side of the graph, of e to the x over x, you would try direct substitution. You'd plug infinity into both of these uh, functions, and you'd get infinity over infinity, which is an indeterminate form. Okay? So that's out. What we need to do here is we need to look at it graphically. Throwback to uh, the first uh, part one of limits, when we looked at graphical representations of limits. If we overlay e to the x and y equals x on the same graph, we'll see e to the x grows a lot faster than x does. Therefore, it will get much larger than x does faster. Okay? And this is going to be things like e... I'm, I'm not sure where e goes after that. It's probably going to be... 2 to the 10, it's going to be something like 3 to the 10, which is some crazy number like 3002, something amazing, and then it's just going to get so much uh, larger, like we're talking 10 to the 20 something, 10 to the 400, and you'll see that 10 to the 400 is like 36 zeros longer than 1,000, okay? So e to the x goes to infinity a lot faster than x does, and therefore the numerator grows unbounded while the denominator stays lower. And we all know that d uh, large numerator over small denominator 
is a positive's number, is a uh, number greater than one. And the larger the numerator becomes than the denominator, the larger that number is. And as we go to infinity, the numerator becomes infinitely larger than the denominator. Okay? Now the same principle can be exemplified if I gave you the limit as x goes to infinity of x over e to the x. This time the denominator grows infinitely faster than the numerator, and if the denominator is larger than the numerator, we get a number between 0 and 1. As the denominator gets much bigger than the numerator, we start to approach 0. And this big limit idea, if we're approaching 0, then the limit as x goes to infinity is 0. Because this converges to something like 1 over infinity, which approaches 0. So those are limits at infinity. And once we get uh, enough practice with our replacement theorem stuff, with our uh, trig stuff, we're going to really need to get all of that down packed, some of our factoring, some of our uh, trig substitutions, all of our uh, multiplying by conjugates. Pretty much every possible way you could use the replacement theorem you're going to need to master, because that leads us into our final topic concerning limits, which is what we call the difference quotient. The difference quotient. Now, we're going to, this is actually a very profound topic, and you're going to see why once we start the next unit. This is our segue into the next unit. But the difference quotient is as follows. It can take on two forms. We can take on the limit as x goes, as uh, x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. And you're going to see that this is a derivation of the uh, slope equation, you know, change in y over change in x equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we're just going replacing y1 and x1 with a and f of a. We're going to need to learn how to evaluate limits like this. And we can modify this limit in a sense to give us a different form of the limit which is the limit as uh, delta x approaches 0 of f of x, excuse me, f of x plus delta x, all in the parentheses, minus f of x over delta x, okay? These two limits will 100% of the time give you an indeterminate form. Therefore, with these two limits, you will need to always use some form of the replacement theorem to solve the limit, okay? Now, with these two limits, with these two forms of the difference quotient, let's try and evaluate the limit with some f of x, all right? Let's say f of x equals x squared, all right? And let's use this form of the difference quotient, because if you'll notice, this form of the different quotient requires you to have an x and an a. Sometimes they don't give you an a, in which case you'll need to use this form. An a meaning some constant, some x value where you will be evaluating this at. So if we uh, were asked evaluate f of x equals x squared at x equals 2, that would be our a. We would set a equal to 2 and we would evaluate this limit. The limit as x goes to 2 of uh, x squared minus 4 over x minus 2, okay? But we're going to pretend like we were never given this, and we're going to try and evaluate this guy. f of x plus delta x, what we do when we see that, you know, when you take a function, you plug in uh, whatever gibberish f of dollar sign is plugged into the f parentheses. So f of dollar sign would equal dollar sign squared based off of this function, right? Which means f of x plus delta x, f of x plus delta x would equal x plus delta x squared, 
So f of x plus delta x equals x plus delta x squared minus f of x, and we're given here f of x equals x squared over delta x, okay? And we're going to be taking the limit as delta x approaches zero. So let's try our conventional methods. Let's try plugging in direct substitution. Delta x equals zero. We're going to get x plus zero equals x. x squared, we're going to get x squared minus x squared over zero, which equals zero over zero in determinant form. Every time you use these, you will get an indeterminate form if you use direct substitution. So we need to find a way to use the replacement theorem. And the way we do that, in this case specifically, is we would select from one of our methods, whether it be trig, conjugate, uh, factoring, etc., etc. The correct method to use here is factoring. First, we need to expand out this quantity squared. And if we expand this out, then we would get x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared. When you've been doing this as long as I have, you start to be able to do this to foil things very fast. Uh, and that's this, so we're going to need to include our other piece, the minus x squared that we left on the outside, over delta x. If you'll see here, this x squared cancels with this negative x squared and we're left with 2x delta x plus delta x squared over delta x. And if you'll see here, we can factor a delta x out of both of our terms. Everyone following what I just did? Good. And now we can cancel those and we can say this equals 2x plus delta x equals 2x plus delta x. Say it with me, everyone, by the replacement theorem. So that's what we simplified this to. So we're going to bring this down here and we're going to say this equals the limit as delta x approaches zero of 2x plus delta x which we can use direct substitution for, which just equals 2x. That's your final answer. Those are difference quotients. Difference quotients, extremely important topic. Uh, we're going to explain exactly what they mean in our next video when we start the next unit, which is the derivative. But before we do that, highly recommend you practice these. So, as always, guys, thanks a lot. Buy those Princeton review books. Those are absolutely amazing. Enjoy life.